Welcome to the Adult Obesity Guidelines webinar series hosted by the Office of Lifelong Learning and Obesity Canada. My name is Sean Wharton. It was my great pleasure to serve as the co-lead of the Canadian Clinical Practice Guidelines. The new Clinical Practice Guidelines are expansive, 19 chapters in a wide range of topics related to obesity diagnosis and management, weight bias, and more, all written by Canada's top researchers, health practitioners, and patient advisors. They're the first truly patient-centered clinical practice guidelines on obesity and the result of more than two years of hard work. Just before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories across Canada of the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. If you have a question pertaining to technical difficulties or programs and services offered by the Office of Lifelong Learning or BC Canada, please use the chat feature of the webinar. If you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A feature of the webinar. Our panelists will answer several questions following the presentation. Some questions may be answered through text in the Q&A window. You can at any point use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We anticipate many questions. Please review what has already been asked and upvote those questions you would like to see answered. We cannot guarantee that the panelists will be able to respond to all of your questions. A recording of the webinar will be available next week. It will be sent to you via email to all those who are registered. This link is, your is for your personal use and is not to be forwarded or shared. This activity has not been formally reviewed by the CFPC or the Royal College. However, it is eligible for non-certified credit. Main Pro participants may also earn additional certified credits by completing a linking learning exercise. Please contribute your experience with obesity management to inform our advocacy and programming. Please take five minutes to contribute your perspective by scanning this QR code. We are very pleased that Dr. Denise Campbell Shear will be presenting on primary care and primary health care in obesity management. Dr. Campbell Shear is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and a family physician with clinical and research interests in evidence-based clinical practice and implementation science. She completed her residency in family medicine at McMaster University, then worked as a rural family physician prior to spending five years in faculty at the University of Michigan. She joined the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Alberta in 2009 and became the Associate Dean of the Office of Lifelong Learning and Physician Learning Program in 2017. She also leads an interdisciplinary research team, the Five A's Team Program, which focuses on improving primary care for people living with obesity. Dr. Campbell Shear served on the Executive Committee for the New Clinical Practice Guidelines for Adult Obesity Management and was the lead author of the Primary Care and Primary Health Care chapter. The floor is yours, Dr. Campbell Shear. So thank you so much, Sean. I'm really pleased to be here to be able to present on our chapter from the guidelines, the Primary Care and Primary Health Care and Obesity Management uh, chapter on behalf of myself and the colleagues uh, uh, that worked on this for a couple of years. Uh, when I was thinking about this webinar, one of the things that I was reflecting on was that the audience for the entire guidelines is primary care. And so in many ways, uh, all of the different chapters really emphasize and support the key messages and recommendations that we want to have um, permeate into primary care and primary health care. So I've woven some of those things into this presentation as well, recognizing that um, for the story to hold together, uh, we have to point to several other parts of the guideline. So I figure out how to advance my slides. Uh, so as uh, just to recap, as we've seen before, the definition of obesity, uh, we're really talking about a complex chronic disease, which is characterized by abnormal or excess um, adipose tissue, which is impairing health uh, and increasing the risk of long-term medical complications to reducing lifespan. And so that really gets into this huge 
irritation of knowledge that we've had over the last 15 or 20 years around the pathophysiology of this chronic disease. I mean, when I was in medical school, um, we didn't know about the gut microbiome and its effects. Uh, we didn't know about the complex genetics of this condition. Uh, we, did, we thought that adipose tissue was just a storage tissue. We had no idea that it was an endocrine active tissue. Uh, we didn't know about the difference between healthy adipose tissue and toxic adipose tissue. So there's been an enormous uh, amount of development of knowledge around the pathophysiology of this condition. And so we've really moved beyond the notion of it just being um, a, a matter of how large someone is and really it's moved into how healthy is someone. So that piece of background, which underpins the entire guidelines, the definition of obesity that underpins the entire guidelines is really fundamental to the shift uh, that is happening, I think, in clinical practice. And because of the fact that this is all relatively new uh, and people my age uh, did not train with knowing any of this, there's still widespread significant misperceptions uh, as to the nature of both the etiology and the effective management of obesity. And additionally, this is complicated by entrenched weight bias and stigma as we've seen previously in the previous webinar in the chapter on weight bias and stigma. Uh, and so we really have to have a paradigm shift here in terms of how we approach this condition. Uh, and for us to really achieve that new vision of achieving primary care for people living with obesity that's consistently high quality and person focused is really gonna require a change in knowledge and skill and practice standards and improved organization of care. And this was summarized beautifully by Dr. Dietz and colleagues in the Lancet in 2015 in their wonderful series on obesity. And it, it's our hope that with these clinical practice guidelines, um, it's another piece towards pushing us towards that future state of uh, more holistic, more person-focused, more evidence-based care for this chronic disease. And so with that, I really wanna rec recap this. And we have seen this previously uh, when we talked about the assessment chapter, um, but I, wanted, I think it bears repeating. We have in these guidelines been endeavoring to move away from a definition of obesity that's just defined by BMI uh, to one that is more reflective of health. So it's irrelevant as to just how big a person is. The issue is whether or not there's excess adiposity, which is impairing physical and metabolic health. So that leads that we need to have a different classification scheme. And what we see here uh, is some of the fundamental uh, evidence for that, this is from Raj Potwell and colleagues, where they show when you look at NHANES data, uh, population data, that uh, BMI classification does not predict mortality. But other classifications like the Edmonton Obesity Staging Scale, which is pictured here, does predict mortality. And this is where we think about the measure of mental, metabolic, and physical impact um, on the person. And uh, we'll have another graphic uh, a little bit further on which goes through the, uh, in more detail, the classification of EOS. And this is the why, this is why we're moving to this. And in primary care, it's really relevant. So if I have a person uh, who happens to be a larger human, uh, who has a BMI of 35, they're a firefighter, and they are a massive wall of muscle and they are not having any physical or metabolic impairments of the fact that they are a larger human. They don't have obesity. You know, there's no need for me to intervene on them. Similarly, I, I could have a patient who has a BMI of 25, uh, perhaps from Southeast Asia with um, excess central adiposity who is uh, having metabolic syndrome or type two diabetes. Well, that we would submit that that person does have obesity. They do have excess adiposity, which is causing metabolic harm. So it's getting more into the impact of the adiposity on the person. And this is the classification scheme in a little bit more detail. So if you would like to have a copy of this, you can get this um, from the CMAJ article in the guidelines. It's in the supplemental materials. Uh, and um, it's reproduced from the article from Sharma and Kushner that was published in 2009. Uh, and you can see here the different staging of obesity and a little bit more of the details of the Edmonton Obesity Staging Scale classification. 
There are also um, in the literature other classification schemas which are uh, coming to the fore as the whole uh, discipline starts to grapple with this notion. Uh, but this was the one that we um, used for the guidelines. And there's some case examples you can see here in the gray boxes just by way of illustration. Uh, so this can be really helpful for us. So practically again, um, you know, in primary care where I may have 40% of my people uh, in my panel uh, being larger humans, uh, this is a practical way for me to consider um, is this something where I should really be encouraging the person to uh, follow up? So practically what I would suggest is, is if, if a person is weight stable, has been weight stable for eight years since the birth of their fourth child uh, and is an EOS zero or one, then the emphasis is really around weight stability and um, just checking in with the person. But perhaps if I have a person who's not weight stable and their weight is um, really skyrocketing, then uh, that's an appropriate opportunity for me to intervene uh, to try to assess what might be going on. Similarly, if I have people moving from some of the higher order stages, perhaps it's a, a good indication that that's a time for me to intensify my approach to treatment. So um, I also really wanted to highlight the very beautiful chapter on obesity management and indigenous peoples. And we had an excellent webinar from Lindsay Crochu and colleagues a few weeks back as well on this chapter, I find it very worth reading. Uh, and just really wanna highlight that in, as primary care professionals, if we're caring for people, um, it's really important that we recognize that the causes of obesity are complex, that there's unique personal and historic factors. And in the case of uh, First Nations, uh, there's issues with regards to colonization and residential school experiences, which affect people very deeply and affect their health and well-being. Uh, and so we have to take that into account um, in terms of uh, working with people. And this is broadly true also for um, people with different lived experience, perhaps um, uh, refugees uh, with various traumatic experience, immigration trauma, uh, people who may have had uh, various experiences in their life that were very difficult. And that just really emphasizes that the point that obesity co-occurs and interacts with complex social, cultural, environmental, and patient behavioral factors. And so the key message here is that um, in order to effectively manage this chronic disease in primary care, we have to really embrace and understand and work with people to, uh, to understand their story and um, understand the implications and meanings of all of these things for people in their lives. And that might sound daunting, um, but practically uh, it translates into much more effective care over the length of the relationship. So it's um, an investment in understanding which will make everything else much more effective. So there's key messages in this chapter, um, uh, which are the indigenous chapter, which are about validating people's experiences of stress and systemic disadvantage, which influences poor health and obesity and exploring elements of their environment where reduced chef, sh stress could shift behaviors. And I, I find this very compelling. Uh, and so I wanted to highlight it here in the primary care chapter because um, any solution has to embed with people in their life world. It has to make sense with, for them. It has to be manageable and achievable for them. Uh, and it has to resonate with them. And so this is uh, incredibly important. And then going the wrong direction. Um, so just in terms of methodology, and we've we've heard about this previously in some of the other guidelines. This is just the chart from the CMAJ article, which highlights the, the methodology of how these guidelines were developed, including this chapter that we're speaking of today. Um, but one of the things I wanted to mention that wasn't in this chart, which is in the text in the guideline, is that we also did look at qualitative and mixed methods research. And we're very pleased about that. That was a real discussion at the beginning of the guideline process. But the conclusion that we reached was that a lot of the clinical questions that matter to people living with obesity and the people that care for them um, are actually qualitative questions. And the proper methodology to address those questions uh, does not fill, fall in typical taxonomy of evidence that you see in a clinical practice guideline. So we took that challenge on and did have a number of questions throughout the guidelines um, especially the weight bias and stigma chapter 
uh, but also in the primary care chapter, which were qualitative and mixed method questions. And the way we handled that evidence appraisal was that there was a group of us who were knowledgeable about the area. And so we did look at the various um, literature that came to the fore in the searching uh, in a structured way and uh, came to a consensus appraisal on level of evidence. Uh, so you will find guideline uh, recommendations in, uh, that are based upon that evidence um, in the guidelines. So what are then the key messages for primary care providers? Well, I've alluded to some of them already, um, but I think the, the most important is this first one. And that is that primary care providers should initiate patient-centered conversations about overweight or obesity. Um, and that we would recommend considering the use of the five A's of obesity, that's the ask, assess, advise, agree, assist approach, uh, starting with permission to ask permission uh, to discuss weight. And that is probably the single most important recommendation, the asking permission. Uh, and this gets back to the weight bias and stigma chapter where we really recognize that um, due to the particular nature of the history of this condition, a lot of people live with internalized weight bias and uh, have also experienced potentially um, bias and stigma as related, their weight, related to the various aspects of their lives. And so a lot of times those People have had not positive experiences in the healthcare space discussing this disease. So the act of asking permission to discuss is very respectful. And there's a, some excellent qualitative research which um, demonstrates that that act of asking um, allows people to be prepared and to decline at that time, but then to come back and say that they would be open to discussing weight. And it helps them to equalize uh, sort of their readiness to be able to speak speak about it with the practitioner. Um, and the second piece of that is um, actually initiating conversations. So if we see in our clinical practice that someone who has been weight stable for quite a while is no longer weight stable, it's good to ask them, would it be okay if we talk about your weight? Can you tell and share with me a little bit about what's going on? Because we know, uh, if you uh, refer to the Science of Obesity chapter and the, and the associated webinar, um, once people have the uh, excess weight, it's extremely difficult to um, reverse that. Uh, and so there's definitely a role for prevention. And prevention of excessive weight gain can happen from well-timed conversations in primary care earlier in the course of the disease to help modify and um, and help the person to be able to engage in, in management earlier. Uh, so in the second vein as well, we really wanna promote this holistic approach to weight and health, which focuses on health behaviors and addressing root causes with care to avoid stigmatizing uh, and overly simplistic narratives like eat less and move more. Uh, and this really ties in as well to the weight bias and stigma chapter. If people have received a message that they did this for themselves and that they are to blame, and if they had just tried harder or just did better, that they wouldn't have this problem, then they'd be very reluctant to seek care. Uh, and unfortunately, that's actually just not correct uh, when we look at the overall nature of this particular condition. So what we really wanna do is understand what people's root causes are of the weight gain. Uh, so, has someone been involved in a traumatic um, uh, experience? Have they been in an abusive situation? Have they uh, suffered with mental health concerns? Are they on medications for other medical issues where they've sustained excessive weight gain? Um, have they, uh, you know, been living in uh, poverty and been unable to have um, reliable, uh, high quality nutrition. Uh, what's been going on with this person in their life uh, that's resulting in them having excess weight? Do they live with chronic pain? Are they having trouble with their mobility due to problems with uh, urinary incontinence? And so we'll talk about this a little bit more on another slide later on in the talk around the four M's, but uh, it gets into what are the root causes and then really being holistic and understanding people, as we said before, their weight, their life, uh, and where their health behaviors um, are situated in that context. 
one of the things that's emphasized in the behavioral chapter as well is the importance of behaviors as a goal as and values as opposed to um, an actual number on the scale. And that's because one of the things that people can work on are their behaviors. They can set goals around that. They are not necessarily going to be able to control what their body does with that behavior. Uh, and so if we focus on things that are within people's control, they're going to be much more likely to be effective. So I just want to draw your attention to this um, graphic over the next couple of slides. You can find this in the guidelines in the CMAJ article um, in the supplementary, supplementary materials. And uh, it's the, um, the framework for obesity management in the appendix two. And you'll notice here there's a couple of QR codes. So the top QR code will actually take you to the website with the different guidelines. And the second QR code um, that I have the arrow pointed to will take you to their five A's in page for um, our toolkit that's been created for uh, primary care assessment. Uh, and again, this uh, just reemphasizes the de definition at the top and emphasizes the importance of the ask with a suggested question that could be used. Uh, and then the assess. So, Going through the assessment, uh, we've had a whole webinar about that under the assessment page. Again, this emphasizes the value-based goals, the classification, considering the root causes and then assessing the disease severity. Uh, and uh, there's the uh, lovely uh, web that we had um, on assessment, which goes into all of this in a lot more detail uh, as well. You can find some of the information on the QR code here. Uh, and then one of the things that's really important at the top here is that these guidelines emphasize that physical activity and healthy nutrition are mainstays of health for everybody, whether or not people have obesity or not. So we definitely want to encourage everybody in those aspects because we want healthy humans. Um, and they certainly are important elements with regards to uh, weight management. So um, we do need to have a caloric deficit in order to actually have weight loss. Um, but uh, it's much more than just uh, a quotes diet. Um, we need to uh, also understand where those excess calories might be coming from. And that's what ties into the psychological intervention. So, um, you know, are people eating for body hunger or are they eating for other reasons? Uh, and that's where there's the beautiful behavioral chapter and associated webinar, uh, which is really worthwhile uh, reflecting on for clinical practice. Uh, and certainly what the evidence does show is that multi-component behavioral modification um, is effective. The other things are also really important, like managing sleep and time management, stress management. You know, if we have patients who uh, live with uh, ADHD, they may be really struggling to manage their time in a way that makes it possible for them to um, prepare healthy meals, uh, do marketing, et cetera, be organized in those ways. So it's a very complicated entwined um, set of conditions. Additionally, we have the cognitive behavioral therapy and our acceptance commitment therapy, both of which have evidence that could be helpful. And these different pillars are not intended to be linear. Uh, they are intended to interweave as is appropriate for the person. And they're on that solid foundation with regards to uh, good nutrition and activity. So the pharmacologic therapy, we had the webinar from Sue Peterson talking about the current uh, approved medications uh, for the management of obesity. And uh, Stephen Glazer and colleagues presented on the bariatric surgery um, as well. So where appropriate, these are um, definitely things that need to be offered to patients. And uh, really worthwhile to look at your EOS classifications and really consider patients who are starting to get into those mortality uh, concerns with regards to obesity and really ask the question, you know, have we, have we done everything that we can do to really help people with this condition? Have we offered them therapy, appropriate therapy? Um, and then as we highlight here as well, um, treating the root causes is fundamental. So if a person has, is no longer weight stable because they now are not able to be as active as they were because they're having problems with chronic pain due to arthritis, the management of that arthritis is obesity management because it is addressing the root cause that is making that person not be weight stable. So um, I cannot stress the importance enough of 
being mindful of all the different things that could contribute to a person not being weight stable. And then we have the agree and the assist. Um, and that's very important. So understanding and working with people about what their value-based goals are and what's realistic and sustainable. One of the key things here is that we want to um, help people have a change that is doable and manageable for them in their life world so that we're not doing a lot of weight cycling, which we'll highlight in a moment. So again, um, obesogenic medications, as we alluded to, are very important. And it's something that I don't think is enough attention is paid to. Uh, we often think about other side effects of Medicaid, um, but we don't necessarily think about whether or not they're obesogenic. And it's important that we consider them and consider options. Uh, and then in people who are at risk for obesity, where we do need to think about a therapeutic option, which is obesogenic, to make sure we're monitoring for weight gain. Uh, and then again, the importance of prevention of weight cycling. So we want people to have sustained changes for healthy habits over time for the long term, not lots of weight cycling, which we certainly know from the science of obesity is detrimental to a person's long term success. So um, just want to highlight that uh, in the assessment chapter, uh, and we had heard about this previously, there is this table of really helpful table. Uh, which highlights these different medications and options for them. So um, such a valuable resource and I encourage people to have a look for that. So in terms of uh, formal recommendations, uh, we do recommend that all primary care clinicians identify people with overweight and obesity and in initiate patient-centered health-focused conversations with them. We recommend that healthcare providers ensure they ask people for their permission prior to discussing weight or taking anthropometric measurements. Uh, very important that we ask people before we measure or weigh them. Uh, also, just really want to draw your attention to the weight bias and stigma chapter, as well as the primary care chapter, where we have um, things that we can do in our um, offices to make things feel more comfortable for patients things such as having the proper size breast blood pressure cuff at the ready, or having a scale in a discrete area um, where people can have some privacy when they're um, being weighed, proper size seating so that people can sit comfortably in their medical home and uh, feel that this is a place that is made for them. Thirdly, uh, primary care interventions should be used to increase health literacy in individuals' knowledge and skills about weight management as an effective intervention to manage weight. Uh, and that was uh, very strong evidence and very interesting. Uh, so uh, once we actually do get involved with the good conversations with people, important to try to assess what they understand uh, and then uh, offer them opportunities to uh, build knowledge and skills um, to be able to have some control and self-efficacy about managing their weight. Uh, as was highlighted in the behavior chapter, our independent review and the primary care chapter of the literature came up with a very similar recommendation um, that multi-component programs with personalized obesity management strategies are effective uh, in helping people with obesity management. And um, additionally, that we can use collaborative deliberation with motivational interviewing to tailor action plans to people's life context in a way that's manageable and sustainable to support improved physical and emotional health and weight management. So one of the things that we did ask uh, as well on the guidelines was uh, in the questions, the particular questions for the chapter was uh, the features of care and primary health care based interventions uh, for clinicians and developers of interventions. And uh, one of the things that came out was that interventions that target a specific ethnic group should consider the diversity of psychological and social practices with regards to excess weight, food, physical activity, as well as socioeconomic circumstances, as they may differ across and within different ethnic groups. Uh, and uh, that's just a fascinating area uh, to really understand that um, some of the ways that different people are acculturated to think about excess weight um, vary dramatically across cultures. Um, so for example, uh, we're working currently with some people from West Africa where in their language, they don't actually have a word for obesity. And in fact, um, being phenotypically larger is a very beautiful and a very desired state. 
However, there is a lot of concern in the community around type two diabetes. And that gets into this notion again of um, uh, adipose tissue, you know, in a place we don't want in the pancreas uh, causing toxic effects. And um, we know that uh, interventions uh, such as increased physical activity can help with some of that visceral fat and help with the type two diabetes quite independent of the actual body mass. Um, so thinking about some of these elements that it's not necessarily one size fits all uh, as far as um, understanding or practices is very useful. Um, additionally, longitudinal primary care interventions should focus on incremental personalized small behavior changes to be effective and supportive supporting people to manage their weight. And this is informed by a, an excellent study that we talk about in the chapter, uh, which really uh, demonstrated the value of, of this small change approach. Primary care multi-health component programs should consider personalized obesity management strategies as a way to help support people living with obesity. Uh, and that just um, shows that some of the, the high quality trials that we found for the literature review really did embrace this strategy and, and it was effective. Um, primary care interventions, which are behavior-based, so nutrition, exercise, lifestyle alone, or in combination with pharmacotherapy, should be used to manage overweight and obesity. And uh, this just really echoes the recommendations which were found in the behavior chapter literature review as well. So uh, there was good evidence for group-based nutrition and physical activity sessions informed by the Diabetes Prevention Program and the Look Ahead Program, uh, which should be used for effective management options for adults with overweight or obesity. So there's a couple of excellent examples out there of things that are effective uh, that could be used to guide consideration of how we might design programs. And uh, interventions that use technology to increase reach to large numbers of people asynchronously should be a potentially viable, lower cost intervention in a community-based setting. Now, there's also an entire chapter of the guidelines about technology, uh, which is very interesting. And I think it's a, an emerging area where there'll be lots more work done over the coming years. And this uh, last recommendation is really near and dear to my heart. Um, because it really reflects um, the gap that currently still exists between the absolute avalanche of knowledge that we have learned over the last 15, 20 years about obesity and the fact that it's lagging to get into practice and lagging to get into educational programs. And um, again, this was highlighted in that Lancet series by Dietz and colleagues. Uh, so we really recommend that educators of undergraduate, graduate, and continuing education programs for primary healthcare professionals should provide courses and clinical experiences to address the gap in skills, knowledge of the evidence and attitudes necessary to confidently and effectively support people living with obesity. I often think of obesity as similar to depression 50 years ago, uh, where people didn't know how to approach it, didn't know how to discuss it. Uh, it was taboo, uh, people were stigmatized, there weren't effective treatments. And um, the sea change that's happened with that now where every single junior medical student is able to confidently assess uh, depression uh, and um, has the skills to be able to open those conversations with patients. Uh, and our hope is that it won't take 50 years to get there for obesity, um, but that we can get the ball rolling on this sooner. So in terms of key messages for people living with obesity from the literature review for this chapter, uh, the first one I think is the one that's most important, which is prevention of weight gain is crucial and realistic. Um, so weight loss is potentially very difficult depending on a person's weight drivers as well as their um, own individual biology. So uh, the prevention aspect is crucial and setting a value-based functional goal that shifts the focus from weight to health and quality of life may help with sustainable changes. So it's not all about perseverating around a number on a scale and feeling good or, or bad about a number. It's about what are the behaviors and the values that um, matter to a person and that are things that they can connect with and uh, really work to try to achieve in a way that feels good for them. Uh, and many medical issues such as disruptive sleep, pain, mechanical problems, metabolic conditions, psychiatric conditions can contribute to challenges with weight management over a person's life. 
So just really encouraging people to seek medical help if they're struggling with weight maintenance or gain. And I'm gonna show the four M's again that we saw in the assessment webinar, but uh, just for people living with obesity to be dialed into the fact that um, these are different things which can upset the apple cart and help people find it more challenging to manage their weight. Uh, and so to reach out early if they're experiencing these things uh, so that they can get back to um, being able to be active and take care uh, and, uh, and enjoy life. Additionally, when people are prescribed a new medication, um, particularly if medication is intended for long-term use, people living with obesity uh, should inquire about the potentially associated weight effects. And this ties into the recommendation we had for providers above. Uh, and increased nutritional, nutrition counseling can result in modest reductions of weight, waist circumference. Uh, and so we do have the uh, entire nutrition um, chapter and uh, webinar, and I think that's so incredibly important and such a mainstay of all of the management piece. So mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapies together with multi-component behavioral interventions may be considered in developing a personal weight management strategy as well. And uh, there's certainly more detail on that in the behavioral chapter. So this is a really interesting exercise to be in for these guidelines from their inception. And um, so grateful to all of you for being here for the webinar and being interested in learning more. And there's a link here on this page uh, to the full guidelines as well. Uh, and so I'll turn it back to you, Sean. Terrific. Thank you very much, Denise. That was a terrific overview of um, exactly what we want to hear about. Um, how is primary care going to manage with these guidelines? And so I, before we go into the question and answer section, I want to tell you that joining us on the panel this evening, in addition to Dr. Campbell Shear and myself, we have Dr. Shabina Walji and Dr. Arya Sharma. Dr. Walji is the medical director of the Calgary Weight Management Center, a community-based center which provides comprehensive and evidence-based care to patients who struggle with their weight. She received her medical degree from McMaster University and her family medicine designation from the University of Toronto. She's a diplomat of the American Board of Obesity Medicine. Dr. Walji is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary, offering clinical teaching to family medicine residents and is currently working to build obesity education into the family medicine, um, uh, um, family medicine curriculum. She's also also extensively involved in the development of professional education programs to increase knowledge about obesity and its treatment of practicing health professionals. And Dr. Sharma has, um, Dr. Sharma was recruited from the Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany in 2002 to a, uh, to a Canadian research chair, tier one in cardiovascular obesity and management at McMaster University. In 2007, he accepted a position as professional chair in obesity research and management at the University of Alberta, where he is also the medical co-director of the Alberta Health Services um, Provincial uh, uh, um, a provincial um, uh, obesity program. In 2005, he spearheaded the launch of the Canadian Obesity Network, now Obesity Canada, which has remarkably transformed the landscape of obesity research and management in Canada. His research focuses on an evidence-based approach to managing patients living with obesity and includes the development of the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. So with those introductions, we're going to start with 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 our questions, and um, my first question is to you, Denise, and thank you for the the overview. Denise, I noticed that the 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 title of the chapter is primary care and primary health care. Now, can you um, maybe give us a little bit of an idea of why what's the difference between these two words and these two concepts? Oh, thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, in our chapter, we were wanting to be inclusive of things that were happening in primary care, that is to say within uh, the medical home, so within the practice or within a care structure directly related to the practice, like in Alberta, we have primary care networks, and in Ontario, they have um, family health teams and other kinds of constructs. That would be more your primary care space, um, whereas uh, primary health care is broader, so it includes 
uh, community programs. So maybe a program that's run uh, through uh, YMCA, recreation center, church, schools. Um, so in the broader primary health care space. Uh, there is a separate chapter as well on commercial programs, which were not included in this chapter. Okay, terrific. Thanks for that, 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 that the explanation there. And, and, and um, uh, the next question that um, uh, comes up is, there has been some discussion, I don't know who wants to, wants to manage this, some discussion about the fact that the word obesity is a negative word and that the obesity guidelines is not what some people wanted to see and they don't believe in obesity, but that weight is a, um, that person has a certain size. And um, uh, so to get rid of that word, um, is, is there a thought on whether primary care doctors should or should not be using this terminology and how they should use it? Well, it's Aria here. So I, I, I can take that one. I mean, obesity is the clinical term that's used to describe the disease. So I think what's, uh, what Denise has made clear in the presentation is that, you know, we, we should stop applying the word obesity to every large person, but base the obesity term actually on a person's health. So it's only when a person has a uh, you know, a health problem or an impairment of well-being because of their size and, uh, you know, their adipose tissue, that's when you use the term obesity. So it's a very technical term. Uh, and we have to kind of make that distinction between using the word obesity in the clinical context uh, and the way that obesity is used in the general population. In fact, actually, when the word used in the general population not only has negative connotations, but it is also generally applied to people who are very, very large. So in fact, a lot of people who you know, based on the clinical definition of obesity would have obesity would actually not consider themselves to have obesity uh, because their idea of obesity is this very, very large 400 pound person who's sitting in their basement. That's obesity for a lot of people. Uh, so we have to explain that and we have to change the term. So we don't do that by picking another term or inventing another term, but really by making sure the patients understand what we mean when we use the word obesity in a clinical context. Great, thank thank you, Arya. Excellent. Um, and and now I have a question for both um, uh, Denise and and Sh 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 Shabina. Maybe we can have Shabina uh, talk look at this first. Is so right after the obesity guidelines were launched in 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 in, in August. A matter of fact, just a, a, um, a few weeks after, a piece in the Medical Post was written by a family care doctor in Sudbury, Ontario, who was very upset about the obesity obesity guidelines because um, and stated that she feels that her patients have elevated weight because they are they are not accountable so they are they have non they have non accountability and also felt that her patients were were incensed or angered when she told them that pierogies were not a good food choice and that they had too many excuses for not exercising and that the government should put up billboards stating that people need to move more and exercise and um, uh, simple messages. Now, this is clearly an example of bias um, and uh, overt bias. Do you think this is common with um, a doctors? Is this just her or do you think it's 10% of doctors across Canada are 60. Are we the minority? Um, uh, and that most doctors feel that accountability and a lack of accountability is the problem and people need to eat less and exercise more. Dr. Walji. Yeah, so thanks, Sean. That's a great question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, I think that whole um, episode, if I can call it that, really is um, a reflection, I think, of the deficiency in knowledge and understanding of obesity in healthcare right now. Um, and so are we the minority? Um, maybe, you know, because physicians and other healthcare providers don't actually learn a whole lot about the biology of weight regulation, the biology of eating behavior, the pathophysiology of obesity. So to me, that really speaks to the knowledge deficit and the lack of understanding of obesity. And it's unfortunate because, you know, that 
really just feeds bias and who experiences um, um, really the, the outcome of that bias, our patients do. Um, and so certainly I've had a number of patients who have spoken to clinicians um, in, in every dimension of healthcare um, and had really um, negative experiences. And, um, you know, and then so it's up to us, maybe the minority to um, educate our peers and to educate patients, you know, about really the realities of obesity and body weight regulation. Great, thank you. That's excellent. And um, Denise, what are your, where did you have any thoughts on, on, on how that should be called out? Should it be addressed? Is there a division forming, um, a polarization with uh, um, some family practice doctors and some others who believe that obesity is is a disease that needs to be treated the way depression or other diseases are, and those that that um, completely believe the the opposite. It felt like that that article was the exact opposite. I think it reflects a couple of things. So one of them is that I think in our medical training, a lot of the way that we're um, taught and a lot of the way that we have to practice driven by some of the time constraints that we have is that we really use um, that teach and tell model uh, rather than the collaborate and coach model. And I think the other thing is that because there's not enough time or perhaps not enough emphasis on really understanding people's life world and really understanding people's complex context, it's, it's hard to do that when, you're, when you have a lot of time pressure. We often uh, fall in the trap of, of considering people perhaps non-compliant about many things, not just a, about some of the items that you refer to here with obesity, but perhaps medication adherence or other things. What I always say to patients is, um, or sorry, to, to my students is, um, there is no such thing as a non-compliant patient. There may be patients for whom I don't know what's going on in their life world or their values and preferences that are making them make really reasonable decisions um, that may be different than what I might hope that those decisions would be. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, what's right for each individual person is going to be different. You know, when you actually really explore with a person who's not taking their medications or their TIA, and you find out that, hey, they can take the medication every three days because uh, they really want to feed their grandkids. Well, you know what? Feeding the grandkids is probably a really important thing. Um, so are the people we're working with right now who may give the fruits and vegetables to their children and they're subsisting on potato chips for the last 10 days of the month until they can get some more money in. So if we don't really have time to really engage and understand, then we can't begin to help people um, sort of come up with solutions and try to navigate that. Uh, I think that what we're hearing with those kinds of comments that we unfortunately saw in that one article, and I wouldn't say that that would be representative of people, are the fact that we're talking about breaking a paradigm and creating a new paradigm. And that's tricky. It means that we have to engage with, a, with a, some content that maybe we don't feel comfortable with. We need to learn how to do things differently. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know what? Family docs and primary care providers are, and pediatricians tend to all be people who are really nice and really want to do well by their patients. Nobody wants their patients to suffer or have harm or um, not do well. And so we're very kind and caring about many other things that people come into clinic with. And I don't think that this is anything that should be more of a leap. Uh, and I think for many people, it's not. I think a lot of times people are scared more about offending somebody, perhaps not feeling confident in how to bring it up or not feeling confident in how to manage. I think that's probably far more the issue than the unf unfortunate attitudes that we heard about in this particular instance. But that's just my um, my impression, my perspective. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm not. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you very much. Yes. Go ahead. Sean, mm. if I could just jump in there. So, so you know, this episode of this, this, this article, it kind of reminded me of something that, you know, I've, I've said before is when you say that, you know, someone has obesity because they eat too much. Uh, that's like saying, you know, someone has depression because they're not happy. And so if I said, you know, the problem with people with depression is, you know, these guys are just not happy and, you know, and they just don't seem to have the motivation to do anything. You know, a lot of these guys with depression, you know, they just hang out and they don't, 
you know, they're not motivated. They spend half the day in the bed. They never go outside. They're not exercising. Uh, you know, that's really the problem with this depression, right? And so people with depression, they need to pull themselves together. They need to go outside, maybe go watch a comedy show, maybe do something that's fun, you know, and that's going to take care of their depression. Uh, you know, if that's how you want to approach <laughs> depression, you would think that's completely ridiculous, but that's exactly how we approach obesity in many cases, uh, because we don't understand the biology of obesity. Now in depression, of course, you know, we understand that there's a biology and that there's you know, stuff going on with serotonin and transmitters and whatnot. Uh, and so we take a very different approach. But I think in obesity, we're kind of stuck in this paradigm that, you know, people have obesity because they eat too much and they have no control and no willpower and just, you know, can't seem to get their act together. And so the onus is on them. And I think that attitude is probably much more widespread than we think. That's beautiful. So what Lee, what, what Lee, Lee, um, uh, Lee Kaplan, the president of the Obesity Society, started his, his, his pre 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 presidential lecture just a couple days ago to open it up. And he said that essentially, it's not that people with, um, uh, with obesity um, eat or eat, eating too much causes obesity. It's that, it's that people with obesity end up eating excessively. It's the obesity that drives this excess amount of eating. And it's the pathological component, just like the depression drives the um, sitting, sitting around and not the ability to not uh, be happy. So I think that's wonderful to look at it in that way. Um, so we have a, a question here from Daisy. Daisy was asking, and Denise, I'll ask this to you. She was stated, I was wondering of the coverage of medication specifically for patients and clients with, um, with, low, with low income. And, um, and we know that you did talk about the indigenous population, the immigrant population. So maybe you could um, take a look at that question for us. Sure. No, and actually, and Elena's as well, I'd like to address as well. So, um, Daisy, this is a great question. And one of the projects we're doing right now is working with a lot of people um, who have significant limitations with regards to um, just even access to food and shelter uh, and medication. And it is a big problem. Just general access to medication can be a big problem. So depending on the jurisdiction that you live in, Usually there's um, some medications as we, most of us would know that are available for some common medical conditions. And some of those medications may be perhaps not the ones that would be best for someone who's living with obesity. So you just have to look and see what's available in terms of your choices. As far as medications for um, obesity specifically like liraglutide or Lestat um, and uh, um, uh, bupropion naltrexone, uh, again, those are very pricey and are very pricey for a lot of people. Uh, and there is, I think, some charitable access and stuff through the companies, but it's extremely limited. And so that is a, a limitation in terms of being able to access care. Uh, you know, Obesity Canada does a um, great job as far as trying to advocate for increased coverage uh, for people. And I think obviously with time, as things come off um, uh, you know, generic and stuff, it'll make it easier. Um, I do want to comment to Elena's question too, if yeah. I might, just very briefly, Yeah, Sean, go but, ahead, please. Can you talk about um, that? Because it, it's in line yeah. with what we were talking about. Yeah, so absolutely. You know, there's no doubt that, you know, a part of obesity management is working with people to make sure that they're informed about their choices um, and that they, that you explore that. But I mean, I, you have to also integrate it with people's life world. You know, again, if people are living on food bank offerings and they don't have food in the cupboard, then the choices that they have may be very, very limited. Now there's different things that are happening in communities around community gardens and uh, other aspects where people can try to have some access to healthier food, but it's really, you know, sure you can advise them, but it's also about exploring, you know, do they have trouble making ends meet at the end of the month? Do they have access to these things? And doing a lot more than just advising, actually helping them figure out how they might be able to get healthier food. So one of the patients we were working with, you know, she ended up, uh, creating a garden and doing some of her own, uh, learned how to grow some vegetables and things. You know, you have to do skills building to help people have healthier options. It's not just enough to advise. Um, I've yeah, had one that's... patient last 20 years where I told them to stop drinking full sugar Coke and they lost 30 pounds. Most people know it's not a question of knowledge. It's a question of skills. 
Excellent. And for those of you who can't see the question, the question was more so that um, she was asking, would you not recommend a person decrease their pr pr pierogies or would you not, don't, do you not believe that pierogies are a unhealthy choice? So why was that doctor's comment that um, uh, patients are upset when we say pierogies are a, a, an unhealthy choice? Is that not, not true? And I guess, and um, uh, Denise was talking about the compassion and the way that you address specific causes, uh, specific um, choices and, and capacities for people to have choices. So, um, and uh, Jennifer uh, Clary has a nice comment as well. And I'm gonna read the comment because it does, it does factor into something that we've seen and we are doing, um, uh, uh, we, we actually know that there's studies that show that doctors actually show the most bias out of, uh, and out of most um, uh, other people. When you ask a patient who shows you the most bias and it's frequently not their partner or their friend or the bus driver, it's their healthcare provider. So we see doctors having the, a lot of this and patients don't wanna to go to see them. So Jennifer says, I see, way too much weight bias in doctors that that um, um, that I work with it makes me it makes it really hard to take a holistic approach to patient care as an allied health provider when the doctor is at such a different level of understanding about obesity as allied health we must always be careful not to disrupt the doctor patient relationship as this is fundamental to the medical home it really feels like being caught between a rock and a hard place and um, and maybe Shai Shabina, maybe you can um, ad address this. Are we are we seeing uh, doctors, unfortunately, with biases that makes it hard for the allied health to even help out? Yeah, for sure, Sean. I think that's a really great comment um, there, Jennifer, and a really important point. Um, and so in my experience with other allied, allied health providers who have sort of shared similar experiences, you know, I think, again, this just speaks to physicians not being educated, um, not really understanding obesity properly. So one way to address that could be, um, you know, if you have a fairly decent working relationship with the, phys with the physician to just say, hey, like, I just learned some new stuff about obesity. Like, is it okay if I share with you what I've learned? Um, and so kind of like, you know, how we would ask permission with a patient, sometimes we need to ask permission with our colleagues, just to share with them what we know. And, you know, if you get kind of a green light to do that, that again, is a, a great educational opportunity to say, hey, did you know, you know, that these are all the factors that are involved in obesity? And did you know that there's these new guidelines that are out that are suggesting we do things this way? And it, it might be kind of a step towards uh, changing that physician's understanding of obesity and maybe how um, he or she interacts with, um, with his or her patient. Oh, um, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, I'm conscious of time. We only have a minute left, and I'm going to give the last word to um, De 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 Denise here. Um, Denise, um, uh, there's been some research now showing that pay, uh, physicians are, are they uh, primary care doctors can easily talk about the fact that um, what the obesity causes in terms of the diseases it causes, but they have difficulty in discussing, uh, understanding why their patient doesn't want to talk to them about elevated weight. So there seems to be a disconnect. Easily talk about obesity causes problems, not easily address why the patient doesn't want to talk to them. And that's been shown in a recent research study. What are your thoughts on that? And that will be our final word. I think that's really interesting. I, um, I think it's probably to do with, as you said, what experiences people may have had before and how they perceive that they're going to be um, handled when they bring these things up and that's why it's such a change for all of us to learn to learn new ways and I you know I think back to the first 12 years of my practice before I learned any of this material and I was at sea with this content you know people would ask me questions and I really wasn't very effective I didn't know how to be helpful I wanted to be helpful I had no idea how to be helpful and um, so there was a really good shift um, after I started learning more and I think as people learn more they'll be able to have more comfort with that and so hopefully people will um, experience more welcome um, interactions and they'll be able to be more open. One of the things that shocked me when I started doing this work a little bit more in detail was patients who I'd known for many, many years who confided to me in me about um, 
some uh, trauma, traumatic events and abusive situations that they had experienced. And I hadn't known about those things. And I had sort of had this hubris that I knew my patients, but I actually really did not have some of that stuff. Uh, and so it came out after we started doing some of this differently. And it opened up whole different therapeutic aspects for the relationship and help people get to better places. So um, I just think we all need to be mindful uh, that, you know, we're always learning, we're always developing as practitioners. And um, hopefully some of the work that, that has been done in these guidelines might help some of us have better conversations with more people and help more people get healthier. That is, that is terrific work and a terrific uh, uh, final word. Um, uh, it's that we can always learn from our patients and open up more and learn and uh, actually end up not acting on our biases as we learn more from the, uh, the patient's words where they're at and being having that compassion. So thank you, Denise, um, uh, for this terrific presentation and the answers. And thank you to Dr. Walji and to Dr. Sharma um, uh, for adding in as the panel. And um, uh, we look forward to um, other presentations by the Lifelong Learning um, uh, from the University of Alberta. And thank you very much for your time tonight. Good night.